think anybody's quite awake yet. Good morning. Good morning. <sighs> it's a beautiful and wonderful welcome, and welcome to those who, of course, are online. We are so glad that you are with us today, and we're grateful for that. Just a quick reminder that we have a wonderful outreach soup after, after the service, and we also have pies, lots and lots of pies, to celebrate, of course, Pie Day. So I'm going to invite Tony up to share the land acknowledgement and the introduction to our video. I acknowledge that I live on the unceded territory of the Wollastookwe, and in particular, the land of the Mi'kmaq, the Maliseet people. May we live in accordance with the spirit of our peace and friendship treaties. And at this time, I want to introduce, we're going to see a short video, and this is an address from the moderator of the United Church of Canada, the Right Reverend Dr. Carmen Lansdowne, uh, recognizing this day of Pi. This year on March 14th, National Affirming Pi Day is celebrating its sixth birthday. This is a day when we can honor all of the incredible affirming work happening across the country. From showing up in solidarity and marching in pride parades, to challenging hate and creating places of safety. Many United Church communities of faith are doing affirming work bravely and faithfully. Pi stands for public, intentional, and explicit. Those are the standards we hold ourselves to when we seek to live into being affirming, welcoming, and inclusive people and communities. On National Affirming Pi Day, we are reminded of this commitment to being public, intentional, and explicit in our affirming work. This work matters. This year, we are focusing on the public part of Pi. Our theme is Pi in the Public Square. As you prepare for your own affirming celebrations, we encourage you to think about what it truly means to be public. Are you part of the affirming work in your wider community? Who are your neighbors and partners? Look for ways to build relationships outside of your community of faith and truly show up in a public way in the broader community. Sometimes reaching out can be hard or intimidating but public allyship requires us to step out of our comfort zone and truly show up in the public square. In each community, this public allyship will look different. I have seen this in how affirming communities of faith are reaching out to other faith traditions to form affirming interfaith alliances, especially in regions where the homophobic and transphobic lobby is strong and vocal. I also see it where communities of faith who have long supported new Canadians entering as refugees are shifting to pay particular attention to the plight of rainbow refugees, those who are seeking asylum because of the risk of persecution and harm because of their sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. Last year, I set an intention to learn more about the historical roots of the justice struggles and of fiction written by the Two-Spirit LGBTQIA community. And I enjoyed reading books like The Book of Pride, LGBTQ Heroes Who Changed the World, Out North, An Archive of Queer Activism and Kinship in Canada, and the young adult novel Friday I'm in Love by Cameron Garrett. This year, my commitment is to be public in my advocacy. I recently joined the National Interfaith Queer Faith Collective and I'm working with the regions to discern where my presence as moderator will have a significant public impact. Thank you to each and every person doing this important work in the United Church of Canada. I look forward to seeing how you will bring Pi into the public square this year. I'm 
going to invite Lynn Fullerton to come forward and to light our special candles today. Morning, Lynn. The light of affirmation that tells us that all are welcome here and that this is a safe place for all. Thank you, Lynn. Will you share in the response with me? Living, Living God, God, our, our source, source, we, we are, are made in your image. image. Show, Show us, us this image in everyone we meet and help us befriend each other and ourselves. In your light, we are all made good. Amen. Let us join together in more voices 62. There is room for all. And if you'll join with me in the reading of the Litany of Friendship. How does God make us? God makes us friends. One friendship is life that is shared, shared without insisting upon rights, though not denying them, shared with respect and love for self to set the standard and starting point for that great love that risks the self that God has given. Who does God make us? God makes us friends. With work to be done, a world to cherish, God first made a person, good like God, but only one, and the person worked well. But come the day's end, the person wept. How does God comfort us? God makes us friends. For everything that was good except being alone, that was the problem. And so God made friends, and everyone saw that it was good. Friendship made good the will of God for people. Why is there gender? God makes us friends. Friendship is male. Friendship is female. To fill a world with friendship through bodies that God makes holy, lovers and parents, living in many and various ways, the highest calling God can offer. 
What then is the best that God can make us? God makes us friends. Let us share now a prayer that is the translation. You will find that on page 916. Let us pray. Our Father, Mother, who is in the heavens, may your name be made holy. May your dominion come. May your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us us today today the the bread bread we need, and forgive forgive us our our debts, as we have have forgiven our debtors. And do not put us us to the test, but rescue us from evil. For yours is the dominion, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to invite Deb to come up and share a wonderful story. Good morning. And I'd like to invite anyone who would like to come up and hear the story with me this morning. I think I see Micah coming. Cora, are you coming up? Good morning, Hannah. <laughs> Here they come. All right, it's nice to see you. I haven't been in church for a couple of weeks. Rita and I were enjoying some time in the sunshine. But it's, it's nice to be back with you, and happy Pi Day to everyone, and happy St. Patrick's Day. And I'd like to share a story with all of you today called All Kinds of Families. And it's written by Suzanne Lang, and it's illustrated by Max Lang. Now, do you know what the illustrator does? Anybody know what the illustrator does? Do you know? They do the drawings. And that's my favorite part of this book. The drawings are incredible. So those of you in the back who may not be able to see the drawings, maybe you can ask me after to have a look at the book because the drawings are pretty cool. So it's called All Kinds of Families. Some children have lots of siblings. Some children have none. Some children have two dads. And some have one mom. Some children live with their grandparents. And some live with an aunt. Some children have many pets, and some just have a plant. Some children live with their father. Some children have two mothers. Some children were adopted. Some have step-sisters and step-brothers. Some children bunk with their cousins, and some have a mom and a pop. Some children's parents are married. Some children's parents are not. 
No matter if you have a ma, a pa, a hog, or this llama. Ten frogs and a slug, or a cousin named Doug. A great grandma Betty and a great aunt Sue, uncles Hal, Al, and Sal, and Uncle Lou, too. One step sis, three step bros, two step mums, and a prize winning rose. A robot butler to serve you tea. The world's biggest grandpa, or whatever it might be. If you love each other, then you are a family. So I love the message in the book and the illustrations as well. So let's say a little prayer together. Loving God, thank you for families of all kinds. Thank you for this church family where we are loved. Amen. All right, have a great time in godly play, and I will see you next week in godly play. Let us share the hymn number 556, Will You Bless Our Homes and Families?
Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of John, verses, or chapters 11 and 12, selected verses. And here we hear stories of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, and Jesus. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, the illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he, was, he said to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. And sa after saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not be, have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always heard me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him, Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. 
With the Spirit, we listen, reflect, and act. Good morning. Between the 1950s and the mid-1990s, LGBT members of the Canadian Armed Forces, the RCMP, and Federal Public Service were systematically discriminated against, harassed, and often fired as a matter of public policy. In what became known to be the LGBT purge, people were followed, interrogated, abused, and traumatized. The LGBT purge was implemented at the highest levels of the Government of Canada and was carried out with callous disregard for the dignity 
dignity, privacy, and humanity of its victims. With its roots in the Cold War, the LGBT purge continued for over 40 years. An estimated 9,000 lives were devastated over those years. The careers and self-esteem of a generation of young people were destroyed. Victims were denied benefits, severance, pensions, and the opportunity for promotion if they managed to keep their jobs. In many instances, the result of this purge was suicide, fear, depression, PTSD, addiction, and numerous other painful experiences. Gay men in the services were interrogated and subject to a type of lie detector that became known as the fruit machine, where they put electrodes on their fingers and then showed them suggestive pictures and things to, see, to sense a reaction, whether their pupils dilated or their pulses increased. Gay women were sexually assaulted by their colleagues in the field to make them straight. Many were sent to NDMC, which is the National Defense Medical Center in Ottawa, and were subject to repeated intense psychiatric sessions at all hours of the day or night. The luckier ones who didn't um, have that kind of experience were investigated, but they were released from the forces and lost their careers, their pensions, and their self-esteem. In many cases, they had to lie to their families about why they were no longer in the military. I am one of those individuals, but my experience pales in comparison to them. After a month of moving to Halifax with my first partner who was in the military, she was called in for interrogation for being suspected of being gay. Although I was not a member of the armed forces, they had already had a file on me and knew where I had lived previously, where, I'd, where and when I had gone to college, uh, uh, and other information about me, about me. This was shocking to me. How did they know so much? What right did they have to go into my private life as a civilian? From then on, we lived under a cloud of suspicion, constantly looking over our shoulders, and knowing wherever we went, there was a good chance that we were being followed or watched. For some, for some reason, I decided to join the reserves in 1983 when we were in Cold Lake. What was I thinking? Uh, I wasn't in for more than three months before I was called in for interrogation with one of our members of the Special Investigations Unit. But I knew enough that about over the years what was going to happen and what they were going to ask me. So I played their game. They asked me the questions, and I simply said, you seem to know everything you tell me. Needless to say, uh, it wasn't long before I took my honorable discharge. But even after all that, the harassment continued as a civilian for me. And it lasted late into the late 1980s with a special investigations unit calling me for information on my partner at home, threatening a security clearance if I didn't talk to them and tell them the things that they wanted to know. They even followed us to an Edmonton Eskimos football game and knew who we'd been with, where we were, what we did, everything. And this was in 1989. When is enough enough? Well, in 1992, Captain Michelle Douglas won a landmark legal decision, a challenge against the military's discriminatory policies against LGBTQ plus service members. This, for all intents and purposes, ended the witch hunts, as we called them, of, it, of the uh, LGBTQ plus service members. But the damage was done. So many innocent people hurt for who they were and who they loved. In November of 2017, Prime Minister Trudeau apologized on behalf of the Canadian government for the historical unjust treatment of LGBTQ plus federal public servants, including those in the Canadian Armed Forces and the RCMP. This pin I wear is in recognition of those unjust years and was awarded to all of the individuals who, unfair, who were unfairly treated. And I wear this pin today with pride. Our next hymn is in More Voices United, hymn number 85, Take, Oh Take Me As I Am. Thank you.
Please be seated. Thank you, Rita. Such courage and such strength to share your story today means everything to our faith family. What can we do? Sometimes it is a monetary giving. Sometimes it is a heartfelt hug. Sometimes it is a smile acknowledging all that we meet and greet. And so we, as we offer our gifts today, we give thanks and praise to God. Will you join me in the response? Holy, Holy God, God, we, we thank, thank you for raising, raising us up and joining us together as one people, flesh and bone, in the body of Christ. Accept these gifts of our selfhood, prayers, and resources, that they may enrich your creation in Christ's name. Amen. Let us take time to pray. Allow a few moments of silence to envelop you. We lift up to you those in whom your image struggles to emerge because of restrictions placed in their way. God, before us, beside us, within us, involved in our past, present, and future, we lift up to you our hearts made complete by sisters and brothers of our time and all time. Julian of Norwich, who wrote of the motherhood of Christ. Alred of Rivaux, who developed a theology of friendship. George Fox, who proclaimed the vision of the Spirit in all. Help us hear your voice in their stories. We lift up to you all those who campaigned against slavery, Pankhurst and other suffragists, and suffragettes, conscientious objectors and peacemakers, the women's movement, and all who strive for equality, the men's movement, and those who strive for an end to machismo, the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered movement, striving for justice and celebrating our wonderful variety. Bind our friendship with the love of Christ now and forevermore. Amen.
As we grow to the end of this wonderful and rich service, let us sing, Let There Be Light. are open because we reach out. Our hearts are filled because we know that the love of God is meant to be shared, not in portions, but to everyone. So go into this world acknowledging all for the beauty and the gift that they are. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.